Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm Bean Gill. I am your moderator for the next hour, and I'd like to welcome you to our live panel on Paralympic Perspectives, the importance of inclusion in sport and, and at school. The highlight of today, of course, will be our discussion with the two Canadian Paralympians. Unfortunately, the minister had something unforeseen pop up this morning, but we are so lucky to have another Paralympian, Terry Thorson, joining us in her place, and it's going to be an amazing event. Before we begin today's event, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the Indigenous peoples past, present, and future of the lands that we are gathered on today. We're joined virtually today from indigenous, indigenous lands all across Canada. I am personally very grateful to be joining you today from my home on Treaty 6 territory and within the Métis homelands and Métis nations of Alberta Region 4. My pronouns are she and her, and I am an Indian woman wearing a pink mesh long sleeve shirt on top of a black tank top with black leggings, and I have chin length blue hair, and obviously I'm a natural blue head. Um, I joined the Club of Disability in July of 2012 when I was paralyzed from the waist down by a virus while on vacation with my friends, and it was Friday the 13th. Obviously, my life was flipped upside down, but I really had no idea how many positives would come from this tragedy or what I thought was a tragedy. Through my journey of my own personal recovery, I encountered activity-based therapies and absolutely fell in love with the program and saw so much neuro recovery. I saw that there was a huge need for a center here in Edmonton because there weren't any supports for people with spinal cord injuries once you left the rehab hospital. Along my journey, I found Nancy, who is my business partner and lead neuroexercise specialist. And together we co-founded Reu Paralysis Recovery Center, a nonprofit organization where we use activity-based therapies to reconnect the brain to the body, retrain the nervous system, and most importantly, redefine what is possible for people with disabilities. Through my journey of being an entrepreneur, I was lucky enough to win a few awards, one of those awards being Top 40 Under 40. That caught the eye of executive producer Caitlin Stewart, who approached me along with another executive producer, Sean DeVries, and we created a docuseries called Push, which is aired on CBC and CBC Gem. This show dives into the lives of myself and my wheelie peeps, and we just show how we live our lives and the struggles that we face and all the wins that we have and all of the love and support that we find in each other. Season two is airing right now on CBC and the season finale will be on Sunday, March 3rd at 7.30 p.m. MST. If you've missed any of it, feel free to catch up on all the episodes on CBC Gem. Over the last 11 and a half years, I have tried many different wheelchair sports, but my favorite wheelchair sport has to be Quidditch. And it's not a very common one, but man, was it so fun. And I just love Harry Potter. And I was a little bit confused about the broomsticks of where they would be, but there are no broomsticks in this. <laughs> I also really enjoy doing CrossFit. I really enjoy picking things up and putting them down. And it's funny because I don't really consider myself an athlete, but I really do work out multiple times a day. So I guess I guess I am. And I firmly believe that movement is medicine. And each of us who can move our bodies in whichever way we can move our bodies, we should. Most people think that working out is a punishment. And I really think we need to change that. We need to reframe our thinking about exercise and movement. Because if you have a body that moves, you should. And being able to work out is actually a privilege not a punishment. So let's change how we feel about that and what we think about that. And let's make exercise and being healthy accessible to everybody. So movement is key for both mental and physical health, as you'll hear from our guests pretty soon. Um, I'm also in a very proud ambassador of the Rick Hansen Foundation School Program, and I couldn't be more excited to be here with you today. We'll begin today's event with a conversation between our special guests, who you'll meet shortly. Then we'll play a fun interactive game of true or false, where you'll get to test your own disability awareness. And we'll finish with a Q and question and answer period. 
Some housekeeping items. You'll note on your Zoom window that the chat function has been muted for today's webinar and your cameras and microphones are also off. We'll be using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions. And if you are experiencing any te technical difficulties, please use that same Q&A function to let us know your concerns and we'll do our best to help you troubleshoot. You can turn on captioning. You can turn captioning on or off at the bottom of your screen by clicking the closed captioning slash subtitles button. If you prefer live captions, they can be accessed with the QR code on your screen. And we're also putting the link to the live captions in the chat. ASL interpretation will also be available for the duration of today's webinar, thanks to Lisa. And as you may know, this coming Wednesday, February 25th is, uh, sorry, February 28th is Pink Shirt Day. This is a day to show support for each other and help put an end to bullying. Here at the Rick Hansen Foundation, our vision is to create an inclusive world where people with disabilities are living to their full potential. If you don't know a lot about Rick, let me tell you a bit about him. Rick's Man in Motion World Tour was an epic 26 month, that's two years and two months, 40,000 kilometer journey around the world in a wheelchair. Rick is best known as the man in motion, and he's also a six-time Paralympic medalist. And of course, he is the founder of the Rick Hansen Foundation, which allows us to be gathered here today. He is also one of my mentors, and one of the one of like the reason I got into keynote speaking was after I saw him speak and just saw how captivating he was and how he shared his story. So speaking of Paralympians, without further ado, it is my honor to introduce our two panelists for today. First up, we have Terry Thorson, Paralympian and manager of the Rick Hansen Foundation School Program. We would love it if you could please introduce yourself, Terry, tell us about your current role and what Paralympic sport, what your Paralympic sport was. Hello, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Terry Thorson. I am um, a white woman wearing glasses. I have long, straight brown hair. Um, I am wearing a white shirt with a red scarf. Um, I use the pronouns she, her. And I, and I'm just going to also say that Josh is also um, very happy to be joining you today from the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, nations. Um, and my sport at the Paralympics was uh, athletics, track specifically. I participated in the 400 meter uh, event um, in wheelchair racing. And I also, not at a Paralympic level, but have a lot of experience as a provincial team athlete with wheelchair rugby. Awesome, thanks so much, Terry. Josh, you're up next. Welcome, Josh Vandervies. We'd love to hear a bit about you, your disability, your sport, and what you do. Incredible, uh, Bean, thanks so much. My name is Josh. I'm a, a white man. I usually have a pretty bushy beard, but I, it was getting way too unruly, so I had to shave it off uh, over the weekend, and now I just have some stubble. I've got uh, I've got my hair, brown hair slicked back uh, underneath my uh, over the ear uh, headset here. I'm uh, I'm wearing some glasses today, clear uh, aviators. And uh, I've got my my Lululemon uh, purple Team Canada Metal Vent Tech uh, shirt on. I just love it. It's so awesome. It has the Lululemon logo and the Canadian Paralympic Committee logo on the chest, and then the Canada flag on the on the left shoulder. And uh, it, you can't see on the video, but if we were uh, in person, you'd be seeing that I uh, am missing most of my arms and legs. So I can, uh, you know, adjust my glasses to kind of show off my arms here. I've got two short arms that end, uh, the, the left one ends right about where the elbow uh, you would expect it to be. And then my right arm is a bit shorter. It's a bit past where the bicep is and the bone sticks out a bit. So it's a pointer and it works really well for me. I can push buttons with that and type away. 
and then uh, my legs they end right near uh, where the where the hips would be and I've got two uh, two little feet there so one with two toes and and one with one toe and uh, I I was born like this without any arms and legs and the doctors don't know why and they still don't know why and it was back in in 1984 uh, back when ultrasounds were not that routine. So even my mom and dad didn't know that I uh, was growing inside my mom's belly without any arms and legs. And so it was a total surprise when I was born. The doctors came in and said to them, you know, there's been a tragedy. Your son was born missing most of his limbs. He's never going to be able to walk. He's going to have to have somebody look after him all of his life. And they painted a, a story that was so, so sad that my mom apparently said, well, is he going to die? And this, the doctor said, no, no, he's not going to die. Well, br bring him in, uh, my parents said. And the, apparently they unwrapped me and kissed me all over and told me that they loved me. And they they showed me that for my whole life. And, uh, you know, together, my family and I, we worked to 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 really find out that in the end, those doctors uh, were wrong. So I went on to, I mean, I can't really walk. I get to shuffle around on the on the floor on my butt. That's pretty fun. But I have a really cool electric wheelchair that gets me around. I use an electric wheelchair all the time. And uh, I ended up going to university and moving out and finding uh, an amazing uh, woman who's now my wife. And we built a, a family. I have a, a stepson and a, a daughter, and I'm a lawyer here in Vancouver. Um, and uh, uh, I'm also uh, a Paralympian along the way. I, I found uh, the sport of bocce, which is a really cool Paralympic only sport. And it's uh, leather balls on a hard surface, and you have to get your either red or blue ball closer to the white jack ball. So it's kind of like curling, it's kind of like the French uh, sport of, of pétanque. And uh, that led me to all sorts of leadership roles like co-chef de mission right now. The Canadian Paralympic Committee has asked me to help lead Team Canada into Paris 2024 alongside my amazing co-chef, uh, Karolina Vishnevska. She's a para-alpine uh, skiing legend with cerebral palsy. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Josh and Terry. Okay, so we're going to get into some questions. Um, we'll have a panel discussion, then play a round of true or false with everyone watching before getting to our question and answer period. So question one, my first question is for you, Josh. How did you get involved with sport? Can you tell us a bit about bocce? Maybe even clarify exactly how you pronounce it because I've been calling it bocha my whole life or since I heard about it. So uh, yeah, let us know. Well, on the pronunciation, I'm I'm pretty convinced that bocce is the, the North American uh, uh, Canadian accent. Bocha, en français, on dit bocha. Et uh, par exemple, j'adore uh, parler français. Alors bonjour à tous uh, qui... Nous joignons aujourd'hui euh, peut-être euh, des classes d'immersion française. Moi aussi, je suis allé euh, à l'immersion française depuis la maternelle et je suis très fier de, de parler français. So, in French, maybe a French accent is bocha, or uh, even maybe a British accent is bocha. But I'm, I'm pretty convinced that uh, in North America, we say bocce. Not, not everyone would agree with me there, Bean, so you can call it. You can pronounce it however you however you want. It's an Italian word, which means a single throw. And so uh, I, I'm pretty sure in Italian, if I could attempt a horrible Italian accent, it's something like bo boccia. And I totally forgot the rest of your uh, question because I uh, got so excited to talk about pronunciation. No problem. I forgot it too. So it's all good. How did you first get involved with your sport? And can you tell us a bit about it, please? Oh, well, the way I found what ended up being my sport, of bocce, uh, is that I tried a whole bunch of other sports when I was a kid. So my parents had put me into swimming lessons at the local uh, 
rehabilitation center in, in Sarnia, Ontario, where I'm from. And uh, so I was learning to swim. I was sort of learning to keep my head above water and then learned the different strokes, front crawl and back crawl. And then one day uh, the, the instructor said to my dad, hey, why don't you put Josh on the swim team? And my dad apparently said, what? Because he was thinking, why would I put my son in a situation where he's just going to get destroyed every single time? And my dad didn't understand uh, Paralympic sport. He didn't know what Paralympic sport is. And Paralympic sport is athletes with similar disabilities compete against each other. So that means that I would always be competing against somebody who had some kind of disability in all four of their limbs. And so he learned that after being told maybe 15 or 20 times, finally signed me up for the swim team. And I fell in love with uh, like racing against myself and improving my time. And then found this idea that, wait, a, I can actually beat other people too and win. And it was the most amazing uh, feeling. And I, I just loved competing. And then I found some other sports, shot put, discus, javelin. I did tie down throwing uh, throughout high school. And I was just trying all sorts of sports and I found bocce. It was a natural other sport to try because it's all about throwing. I hold the ball between my arm and cheek and then roll it down my short arm and then flick it off the end to to throw it and loved it. It's uh, It's all about outsmarting your opponent and uh, outperforming your opponent. So, you know, I think I think all it, it's a lot like chess. That's why it's so fun. But I'm pretty sure all of us athletes just wish that we were chess players because I, my good friend Erica Weeb, she's an Olympic champion wrestler. She, when I heard her one day say, "Oh, wrestling is just like sweaty chess," then I realized, oh yeah, all of us athletes just wish that we were chess players. That's awesome. I actually don't know how to play chess, but I've tried to learn so many times and just can't get it. I'm a checkers kind of girl. <laughs> um, do you mind telling us about another para sport that maybe not everyone has heard of? Oh, sure. I'd be happy to. So, uh, well, bocce is a Paralympic sport in the Paralympics only. And then th there's one other one. Uh, there are two. And so the other one is a sport called goalball, which is played by athletes with uh, vision disabilities. And it's three athletes versus three athletes, and they all wear uh, ski goggles that are totally blacked out. So even if you're already blind, you wear a ski goggle that blacks it out completely. And what that means is that athletes with different uh, levels of sight can compete against each other fairly. And so it's three on three, and then they whip a heavy medicine ball with bells in it at each other. And you have to listen and uh, feel where the ball is going to be. And then you throw yourself on the ground uh, to block it. And uh, if you don't block it, then it goes into the the goal and it's a point. So, so awesome. And uh, I was also co-chef de mission uh, in Santiago at the Parapan American Games in, uh, in, in Santiago, Chile. And there, the Canada Canadian women's goalball team qualified for the Paris 2024 Paralympics. They upset uh, Team USA to get a qualification spot. It was so fun. The, the stadium was full of spectators. And the rule is you have to stay completely silent while the play is going. So the heavy medicine ball just goes back and forth, back and forth, and the the silence builds and builds and builds until somebody finally scores. It's so exciting. Wow. I love how hardcore these sports are. I love it. Like, you know, just because you have a disability, it doesn't mean we're going to go easy on you. We're going to throw heavy medicine balls at you and you got to figure out how to get out of the way. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Terry, my next question is for you. What sport, what did sport mean for you growing up? And how does your past involvement in sport lend itself to your current role? Great question, Bean, thanks. So I should first sort of preface that I acquired my disability um, in my twenties. Uh, I had a, a motor vehicle crash while I was traveling on vacation. And so I didn't have a disability 
uh, before my injury. So um, in school, I actually really hated sport. I was terrible. I was the last person picked on every single team. I um, No one wanted me to play sport. I felt like humiliated all the time. My first track event, because I tried, I, I was very open to trying sports. My first track event, I was in hurdles and I tripped over the first hurdle and was bleeding. And I just basically walked off the, the well, kind of probably ran off the track and went to the bathroom and cried. I never tried sport again after that. I hated it. And so after I had my injury, a lot of people were trying to convince me, oh, you should try wheelchair sport now, Terry. I'm like, I am not an athlete. I hate sports. I will never be involved in sports. Finally, one day I decided to try it. And I think it was the exuberance of a volunteer who was kayaking, uh, who's turned into a good friend of mine. Um, and he said, you know, he was just really excited and passionate about kayaking and wanted me to come try kayaking. I was like, how am I going to kayak? First of all, I don't even have any hand functions. So how am I going to, you know, actually paddle? Don't worry about it. They got it all figured out. They're going to figure it out. And I had the best time. It was so much fun. I'm also really afraid of the water too, I should add. So the fact that I had a really good time made me think, well, I wonder what else I'm missing out there. So then I just started trying a whole bunch of different things and I found racing. And one of the things that I loved about racing was that it was really inclusive. I didn't feel any different than anybody else who was on the track. We had able-bodied people doing it. We had paraplegics, you know, quadriplegics, tetraplegics like myself participating. And although we don't compete in the same division, we're all out there together. And it was a really social community. So I felt really great. And how does it sort of affect me now and, and my involvement? Well, I'm definitely not afraid to try anything that is out there. I think that is the biggest thing that I learned is that the opportunities are really endless for anyone, whether you have a disability or not. Uh, and I think that, you know, the, the things that I learned through my involvement with sport, sport about, you know, working hard. I mean, there's just years of effort that you put into to make a Paralympic, to be a Paralympic athlete, athlete as Josh knows, you know, there's a lot of sacrifices that you have to make and they're in, it's really, really hard. I had to eat my, my nutrition had to be on point. You have to be super hydrated. You have to train every single day it's like every full-time job so you know I, I realized that I can you know I can pretty much do anything that I set my mind to and that's how I live now I love that so much I want to touch on a couple of things you said first of all being able to just try anything and I think that's such a great attitude to have because I, I believe the same thing that we need to try everything in order to find out if we like it or not. And like you said, it's okay to um, not like something. Um, I love that. And another thing you said is we'll figure it out with the kayaking. And I have a three-year-old niece that lives with me here. And um, that's something that I've taught her. And, you know, when something falls, she cries or whatever. And I just have to say, hey, we'll figure it out. So now that's her slogan. She'll say, Pua? we'll figure it out. I'm like, that's right. We'll figure it out. And just like having a disability, you're going to figure it out. That's what we do as humans. We adapt. We adapt to our, our circumstances, our environment. And I don't know who knows that more than Josh and Terry. Okay, question three. My next question is for both panelists. Josh, you can go first. Um, can you tell us about a really great moment of inclusion in sport? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll say one from my own uh, from my own experience, if that's okay, Bean. So uh, I I have a really good memory back when I was in elementary school. Uh, I at our school we would always be playing the sport uh, outside the game of four square. I don't know if people have seen that, but it's like this big square painted on the tarmac and then uh, a cross in the middle, so it's four squares. And you uh, you bounce uh, one of the dodgeball type balls uh, into the square, and then the person has to grab it. 
uh, and if you don't grab it, then you uh, you lose the point. And I I loved uh, like watching and uh, laughing with my friends, and they just would always let me play lots of times. And so I they would just kind of like let me be in my wheelchair in the square and then throw it, and that's pretty cool. And but then of course I could never uh, I could never catch it. Uh, so uh, you know that was hard. And then I would be allowed to. try to be on the ground and do it and I could like really skim it right across the ground and then they had no chance of ever of ever catching it and it was super fun we were laughing and uh and giggling but when I think back on that I I remember it was so fun to just be around my friends back then but I wasn't really included because the the modifications were just were too much and it There wasn't an ability for us to really be inclusive altogether. But one way that I was able to be inclusive altogether was playing marbles back in elementary school. I could just get down on the ground in the grass and uh, like take a marble from my fanny pack and like roll it. And then the game is that if you roll the marble and it hits the other person's marble, you win their marble and it goes into your fanny pack. Oh, it's just the most fun. Oh my God, I love that. I also had a fanny pack full of marbles. <laughs> Terry, how about you? Josh, I was just thinking, you started your bocce career really early in elementary school, essentially, right? Right. You oh, yes. <laughs> um, I think I probably shared already my experience with athletics and, and really connecting me to the disability community that really, I felt really included, but You know, even though it was, uh, like I said, a disability, uh, a sport that was focused for people with disabilities, it was everyone was welcome to participate sort of at, you know, the grassroots local local level. So that's um, what made it feel really inclusive to me. I love that. Okay, so now we're going to go to a live poll. So for all of our viewers watching, I want you to think about your experience with sport. We have a live poll. We'll give you 30 seconds to respond here. Just go ahead and vote yes or no if you've ever felt excluded in sport. Here we should have some like sort of Jeopardy music or something. I don't feel confident enough to pretend <laughs> and sing for you guys. <laughs> but the poll answer should be coming up here in just a second let's see if people felt excluded from sports so 66 percent said yes 34 percent said no okay so now to both panelists here's another question for you both so how can we be how can we be more inclusive in sports and activities We'll open this up to everyone watching. Um, you can put your ideas in the question and answer and I'll read some out to share with the group. Uh, so the question for our panelists, Terry, you can go first, was how can we be more inclusive in sports and activities? Um, this could even include games at recess or field trips. Yeah, I think, um, how, how can we, that's a good question. So there's lots of different ways. I think first you need to, be able to ask. So if you have asked, if you can ask people how to be more um, inclusive, maybe it's a physical barrier, maybe it's an attitudinal barrier that they're facing. Maybe it's just really hard. They don't, it's not comfortable to go out as a group or um, they don't feel like they have a buddy um, or, you know, the bus that you sit on, you, if you're in, use a wheelchair, you're sitting in the very back and not with your friends, right? So there's little things. And so first it's, we need to be able to identify what those barriers are and then come up with solutions on how we can make this more inclusive. So that would be like any field trip or any activity. Um, and I think it's just making sure, you know, it really just starts with, you know, kindness and involving people with disabilities and not, as I mean, the whole idea of ableism is making a decision about a person with disability um, 
without their input or their guidance, right? And it's it's someone that's able-bodied that decides that this is what people with disabilities need. So your first sort of task is to be able to include and not just include, but be able to ask and, and let them lead the way for what they need themselves. Yeah, great answer. Thanks, Terry. Josh? How do you feel? What can we do to be more inclusive in sports and activities? Well, Terry really uh, was on the mark there. It's all about identifying the barriers and then figuring out what we're going to do about those barriers. And that's that's how you are inclusive uh, in everything, in sport or or not in sport. So really encourage everyone to always think about that at the very beginning identify what the barriers are, and then figure out what you're going to do to reduce each barrier. In sport uh, specifically, I, I would say that it's a, it's a two-way street for inclusion. It's, it's for everybody to include somebody who's going to be included, and it's for the person who's going to be included to include themselves. And so that means to be figuring out what you can and can't do. It's to always be brainstorming and understanding what you like to do, what you want to do, what you can do. And one of the ways is to try as many sports uh, as you can, to always try more and more. And I mentioned my wife earlier. She's a, a, a non-disabled uh, former international fencer. So she's a big athlete too. We're a pretty athletic family. And I'm I'm pretty athletic, I would say, but compared to my wife, like I just hate doing cardio sports so much. I hate cardio. Even in swimming, I like the small uh, distances. I like throwing, but stuff like going for long runs or like cross-country skiing or cycling, it's just pure misery to me. But some people really like those uh, those cardio sports. So it's about learning what all the sports are and then thinking about, hey, maybe I could do that. Maybe that's something that, that I might like to do. It's whether you like to be involved in a team sport or an individual sport. Do you like to be indoors in, in something like fencing or badminton? Or do you like to be outdoors in a, in a more social activity or sport like, uh, like soccer or, or field hockey? Awesome. Yeah. And I think uh, something you said, Terry, kindness, I think that goes a long way in um, whether you have a disability or not. And I think if you are any person trying, wanting to try something new, just having kindness and creativity and that willingness to keep trying is what something both of you have said. And I fully agree with that. Okay. Uh, so one of the comments we have is take the time to get to know the abilities and interests of all participants, then include the, the group in coming up with ideas on how everyone can be involved in a meaningful way in the activity. Another one is information. Knowing what you will face is a game changer in both access and inclusion. Fully agree with that. And somebody says a quote we live by is nothing for us without us. That's right. Nothing about us without us is another way of saying it that I've heard before. Fully agree with that. Okay, so this question is for you, Josh. Can you tell us a bit more about what a chef de mission is? And I probably, sorry, I don't speak French. <laughs> tell us what it is and what are you most looking forward to for the Paris 2024 Paralympic Games? Oh, sure. And just uh, if you'll indulge me real fast, because Minister Qualtro isn't here, part of her amazing leadership in our country is that she has taught us all Nothing about us without us is really just nothing without us because everything uh, is about us. And it's such a cool evolution of that uh, long time powerful slogan in the disability rights movement, nothing without us. And then that's, I guess, a good segue into what a chef de mission uh, does mean. So we are the uh, administrative leaders of the team that goes in and just deploys the whole multi-sport uh, event. So it starts long before the games and all the way up into the games. And what we do is we lead team members, we 
uh, we do that by uh, giving speeches and back and forth communication. Then we help uh, communicate the team's messages about performance and celebration to the media and to Canadians. And then we do the same thing with, with sponsors of the team. Awesome, thank you for so much for sharing that. Um, Terry, what do you want people to know about the Paralympics and or sport for people with disabilities? Okay, what do I want people to know? I, actually, first, I just want to uh, um, address one thing that came in the chat to us um, that just said, Josh, thanks, Josh, for pointing out the key point, reduce each barrier. And I'm just going to, I'm just saying this out loud because I think it's a really important point to make. Um, I think people often try to eliminate all barriers and it may seem like an overwhelming task. It won't always be perfect, but when the effort is there, it is generally impactful and totally agree. Like it's, it, it's impossible to make a completely barrier free for everybody experience. Um, but if we can just try to reduce the barriers, then it makes it a lot easier for us to be able to participate. <laughs> so thank you for that comment. Um, and what do I want people to know about the Paralympic sport? is that it's the same as any Olympic sport. The amount of effort, the amount of time, um, that it is equal par to an Olympic sport, but unfortunately it's not recognized as such for some reason. Uh, we certainly don't have the same amount of sponsorship opportunities that are available, the same uh, viewership. So I really want people to know how hard the athletes work and um, that it, it, we, it's a still the same four years, you still have to qualify. Yeah, there's a lot of competition um, and it is a full-time job for most, most of these athletes. So, uh, and you know, they're trying to live and work and raise a family at the same time as, as having this, uh, as this job as a Paralympian or, or athlete. Yeah, thank you. It is really difficult. Um, first of all, the expenses right now are astronomical for all of us. Um, and then for athletes to have a full-time job and have another full-time job of being an athlete is quite difficult. But just like everything in life, everything's hard. Nothing's going to be easy. So if you're going to do it, go do it. Don't let that stop you because if we start to let everything that's hard stop us, we're not going to be living life. We're going to be existing. And that's no fun go live life, go do the hard things. That's what we're meant to do. It's why we were either born this way or acquired these disabilities later in life is because we can do hard things. Okay, so we are gonna go to the true and false section here. So we have somebody coming up on the screen, right? <laughs> um, so I'll read it out for everyone. So whether you're answering individually or as a class, we'll have you answer whether you think the statement is true or false by using the Zoom polling function that'll appear on your screen. So we will start with question one. True or false, people who are blind or low vision can't play sports because it would be too dangerous. Is that true or false? Let's see what everybody says. And while we're waiting here, I just did want to mention that uh, wheelchair basketball is actually a sport that um, the local level can be enjoyed not only by people with disabilities, but also with their able-bodied friends and family, making out a super inclusive sport. So check out BC Wheelchair Basketball's website and you can find a team close to you. So the answers came back and everybody guessed right, 100% false. That's right, it is false. Uh, there are plenty of ways to ensure people who are blind or partially sighted can safely uh, be included in sports with physical activity. And there are many adaptive sports designed for athletes with vision disabilities, such as goalball. Up on the screen, we have a photo of one of the ambassadors, Robert, he is blind, and these are just some of the sports and activities he's loved to do from race car driving to skydiving and tandem biking. And if you ever get a chance to speak to Robert, I highly recommend you do because he is an amazing human being and just, just a spirit that is just 
it just makes you feel good. So if you get a chance to talk to him, please do. Okay, question two. Wheelchair rugby is an example of a high contact sport that people with mobility disabilities can play. Is this true or false? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Let me see some sort of <laughs> music here. And the answer is, everybody got it right, 100% true. That's right, wheelchair rugby is a very physical, very fast paced game where players can fall out of their chairs and their coaches help them right back in if needed. I mean, there's a reason it's called murder ball. It is a very aggressive game. And personally, I love watching it, but I'm not, it's not one that I like to play, but I do love watching it. Okay, question three, true or false? Students with a disability shouldn't participate in gym class. What does everybody think about this? Should students with disabilities participate in gym class? True or false? Let's wait a few seconds. And the answer is false. That's right, everybody got 100%. Wow, good job. Um, students be should be participating in everything, whether you have a disability or not, that is what true inclusion is. And the limiting beliefs put on by other people or the medical system or whatever saying you can't do this, you can't do that, that's shouldn't be paid attention to. We should be able to see what we can do, what do you want to do, and how can we do it. So everybody should be participating at all times. Okay, question four. Uh, there are over 25 sports at the Paralympics. Is this true or is it false? And just a sidebar here, when I was first paralyzed, I looked at all of the Paralympic sport list because I was like, what is it that I could actually do? I did kickboxing before I was paralyzed. And then I looked up wheelchair boxing and saw how hardcore it was and said, no, that's not for me. But it's funny you mentioned fencing, Josh, because that's one of the things that I think um, I could do. I just did try it last year and my boyfriend is actually a para fencer and uh, it's a great core workout. Wheelchair okay, fencing so, is amazing. Yeah, wheelchair boxing isn't in the Paralympics yet, but maybe one day. There are lots of cool wheelchair boxers out there. Oh, really? I thought it was. It's just too hardcore for me. Okay, so what are the answer? What's the answer? Is it true or is it false? It's true. There are over 25 sports in the Paralympics. Thank you, everybody, for participating in the true and false portion. That was really fun. By being here and increasing your knowledge of people with disabilities, you are being part of the change. My challenge for you is to pick one action you take as a student or a class or a school that will make sure no one is left on the bench. Our Difference Maker, maker of the Year applications are now open until April 7th. More info is available on our website linked in the chat, chat about how individual youth or classrooms can win up to $1,000 for a project they work on that makes a positive difference in the lives of people with disabilities. So be sure to check that out. We put up a slide showing some of our Difference Maker Award winners last year. We had a group make an educational video about speech to text technology. A class did an accessibility audit of their school and started making changes so it is accessible for all. We had a young man who makes TikTok videos about his life with a disability, so he's spreading awareness. And we had one student who organized an accessible prom for all students to attend. I love that. This could be any of you. All of us are difference makers. Every single one of you is a difference maker too. So get your thinking cap on and think, what can you do to be a difference maker and then go apply for that award? Because just like everything else, you won't get it unless you apply for it. Okay, now we're going to open up our question and answers. So if you have any questions, pop them in the chat in the Q&A section now, and we'll get to as many as we can. While everyone is getting to their keyboards to send in questions, let's take a look at some of the questions we received in advance of the webinar registration. Okay, so panelists, what were three, what were the 
what were the two of you doing when you were our age, 10 years old, in terms of sports, art, et cetera? So Terry, you already commented a little bit about this, but Josh, we'll go with you first. Oh, yeah. Well, for sports, I mean, back when I was uh, a 10-year-old, I was just learning how to swim and uh, getting getting started. And I was doing lots of art as well. I hold the, the paintbrush between my arm and uh, cheek, and I can paint like that. And that's how I write with a pen. Awesome. Terry, you have anything to add? No, I don't think it. Probably the same as every other 10-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then, so next question, what or who has been the biggest support in your life? Terry, we'll start with you. Uh, well, I have to say my family. I would really not think that I probably would not. I mean, they helped me have the coping skills you know, that I have, I think that helped me be able to um, see those opportunities and deal with my injury in a positive way. Um, but also, they didn't treat me any differently. I mean, I, I'm uh, really, it made no difference whether I'm rolling around in a wheelchair or whether I'm walking. Um, so I think that is why is who probably my biggest support. Awesome. Josh, how about you? Well, it's family for me as well. And uh, along with all of their amazing uh, financial support, and this is my parents and even my wife, who was my family for many of my years as an elite athlete. Beyond all that, it's also that they are really good at helping me talk through the barriers to try to figure out what the barriers are and then how to reduce them. I love that. Yeah, my family has also been a big, huge support for me, my mom, especially. Um, and then my friends, too, in treating me the same, not treating me any different, not treating me like I was a burden on them or that I was different. Okay, question three. What advice would you provide educators and school staff when creating a culture of inclusion for people with and without disabilities? Terry, we'll have you go first. I think maybe I'll just kind of stick to the redu reduction of barriers, you know, having conversations with, you know, parents, the, the student um, that has a disability, finding out, you know, how, how you can reduce those barriers. And I think I'll kind of stick with that answer. Josh, over to you. <laughs> I say lean into the fear. Because there's lots of fear. It's so, so scary to figure out, is this going to work? Is this going to include someone? It's so scary for the person. Am I going to be able to do this? And you have to lean into that fear because the scariness is why inclusion in sport is is so fun and so powerful. Because if you have the courage to figure something out, try it, fail, try something else, fail, try something else, and then succeed, it it builds so much. Amazing answers. Yeah, I fully agree with that. You have to try. Okay, and then I'd love to know more about how to engage with children on their level with these topics. And do you have any resources you can share with phys ed teachers for their gym classes to help with adapting lessons? So um, the Rick Hansen Foundation has an entirely free online resource library with lesson plans and activities to help educators. We'll pop a link in the chat. I think it just popped up there um, with how you can engage children on, your, on their level and provide resources to teachers. Okay, so it's inter International Women's Day is less than two weeks away. And... Terry and myself, uh, we are both strong female leaders. Um, have you faced any challenges, extra challenges, being a woman with a disability? And do you have any advice that you might have given to the younger version of yourself? Terry, you go first. Oh, Bean, you sure you don't want to go first? Come on, this question is meant for you. <laughs> I'll, no, I'll just say that, you know, obviously, you know, having two, I guess, visible um underrepresented 
did I, I, well, I wouldn't call it a, my gender a disability, but in a way, sometimes it is seen that way. Uh, similarly, um, it has caused some, um, I, I, I haven't seen as much participation. Uh, so in sport, um, for women. And so one of my goals is to try to uh, identify some of the reasons why um, women are, and girls are not participating in the same same way that their male counterparts are. Um, that's kind of a real um, piece of advocacy that I'm working, looking into right now. Um, and yeah, and especially in wheelchair rugby, uh, because it is a co-ed sport, that there's very few women that are represented in, in that sport. So that's um, really important to sort of identify, you know, and, and, and try to encourage that participation. Yeah, I found for myself too, I mean, I'm often always the only female in the groups. And I know for spinal cord injury, alone like there just are more males with spinal cord injury than females so when I find somebody I'm often like oh there's another girl in a wheelchair we must be friends we must right and then get them to try to come out and enjoy and try different um, sports and stuff as well and any advice that I would have given to my younger version of myself is what you said Josh lean into the fear lean into it everything's going to be scary but if you give into that fear you're going to be scared for the rest of your life and when we can find our courage and our bravery, which all of us have within us, we're able to face those challenges and reduce those barriers and then also see what we're truly made of. And that gives you true confidence, which is really to trust within. Okay, awesome questions. Okay, so now we have some questions coming in from the audience. So let's read these. Is tennis in the Paralympics? I don't know. Is, is Wheelchair there? tennis is, yes. Ah, okay. Thank you. Um, question two, do you wish that you weren't disabled or are you happy with what you have done as a disabled person, even if it meant never getting Paralympic medals? Oh, well, that's a good question. Josh. That's really good. Yeah, great. I, I, I don't wish that I wasn't disabled and that's because I, I never knew anything differently. So this is how I've always been from the very second that I was born and uh, I no I, I I'm very glad that I did get some Paralympic medals would I would I be an athlete without getting Paralympic medals I don't know about that but I would definitely keep uh, the way that I am awesome thank you Terry so yeah, it's a really good question I obviously had uh, an experience of both being, um, you know, having walking around versus being in a wheelchair. Um, and it's funny because I think people in our community being, you can probably relate to this. We would never say, we would say that we would never wish this life on anyone. However, <laughs> we also, um, the opportunities that I have had as a person in, in a wheelchair are amazing. Um, and yeah, similarly with Josh, I would have never have been an athlete. Um, I would never have gone to the Paralympics or, or well, the Olympics even. Um, I wouldn't even try. There are so many things I wouldn't have done in my life until I had my injury. Uh, and now I can look at it and say what a, what a sort of great blessings that have been in. But it's actually not the 